Uh, hello, I'm Dee 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 Fairchild Ruggles of the unit, director of the unit for criticism and interpretive theory, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon for a lecture by Professor Tim Ingold. This is the last event in the unit's 22-23 calendar. Can you hear me okay in back? Okay. Uh, for those of you who may be new to the unit, I hope you will keep your eyes open for the modern critical theory lecture series that occurs next fall, in fact, every fall on Tuesday evenings at 5.15. The MCT, as it's known, features invited lectures on themes ranging from Marxism to queer theory to race, indigeneity, and the body, presented by guests invited from elsewhere and by theoretical thinkers from among our own faculty. Now, before I proceed to introduce our speaker, I want to recognize and acknowledge exactly where we are. We are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Odwa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kikapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and the lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as those histories of dispossession that have allowed for the very growth of this institution for the past 150 years. So over the next 150 years, our collective plan, the university, is to be a vibrant community inclusive of all our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. This afternoon's lecture is one of a few designed to celebrate the unit's 40 years as a major center for theory in the humanistic and social sciences. The unit was first proposed in 1981, having grown out of a criticism seminar of faculty primarily from English, French, and philosophy. Today, the unit includes faculty and graduate students from art history, classics, communications, comparative literature, dance, education, geography, history, landscape architecture, that's me, and architecture, dance, education, wait a minute, I got lost, law, religion, sociology, and anthropology. It's a very long list, and it's actually very easy to get lost, and I didn't name all of the departments and programs. I'm very proud of that breadth, by the way. The unit was approved by the university and opened its doors in 1982 with an annual budget of $3,000, which is just inconceivably small. The original pro proposal of 1981 for the unit justified the need for such a center by defining what theory is, and I will read you that definition a body of general principles that makes possible the description, analysis, and evaluation of texts, cultural institutions, and historical and interpersonal processes. Such principles then describe and structure the relationship between concrete physical events or objects and their human significance or meaning. Now, if you know anything about the work of Tim Ingold, you will know that that last sentence about objects and their significance for humans is not something that he would allow to go unchallenged. Tim Ingold is a renowned anthropologist whose work has examined the relationship between the material and the social in the fields of anthropology, archeology, span art, and architecture. Sometimes called a phenomenologist, Ingold writes about humans as beings that move through and sense a world that is itself also in movement or moving, such that the various bodies, be they human, botanical, geological, the bodies cannot be separated into discrete objects. In recent work, he has sought to replace traditional models of genetic and cultural transmission of practical knowledge which rely on an alliance between neo-Darwinian biology and cognitive science with a relational approach that focuses on perception and action within social and environmental contexts. And already I can say that the word context is now problematized in my mind on the basis of conversations that we had this morning and yesterday with the dance department and the anthropology department. 
Professor Ingold holds the chair of social anthropology, or did hold the chair of social anthropology until his recent retirement at the University of Aberdeen, and he is a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. His 18 books, and in fact, it's more than 18. I realized I think it's more like 19 or 20. I, I lost count in just a few years ago. His 18 plus books and edited volumes, which have been widely translated, include, and I'll just name a few, The Appropriation of Nature, Essays on Human Ecology and Social Relations, that was in 1986. Lines, A Brief History in 2007. Being Alive, Essays on Movement, Knowledge, and Description in 2011, and Correspondences in 2021. And that's not the last, because he's actually had one since then. The title of his lecture this afternoon is a quote adapted from his 2018 book, Anthropology, Why It Matters. Now, before we proceed to the lecture, just a word about the structure of the event. Professor Ingold will deliver his talk, Philosophy with the People in the Trajectory of an Environmental Anthropologist. And then the lecture will be followed by a short interview with our speaker in which my colleague, Aaron Riggs, will join Tim and me for a reflection on how his thoughts have evolved over the past 40 years. And then we'll open it up to discussion with all of you and conclude with a light reception, probably at about 5 o'clock. So with that, Tim, I invite you to the podium, and, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Divi. It's an, <clears throat> an honor to be uh, with you all. I hope my voice lasts out because it's a bit shaky. <clears throat> so, philosophy with the people in. That's my short definition of anthropology. And it carries an implicit criticism of philosophy as done by philosophers. The questions we address are much the same. They're questions of what it means to live a human kind of life, of how we know, think, imagine, perceive, act, remember, learn, converse in language, live with others, organize, organize ourselves into societies, build institutions, administer justice, exercise power, commit acts of violence, relate to the environment, worship the gods, care for the sick, confront mortality, and so on and on. The questions are endless, and philosophers have addressed them at length. So have anthropologists. But here's the difference. Philosophers are, by and large, reclusive souls, more inclined to turn inwards into a studious interrogation of the can canonical texts of thinkers like themselves, mostly, though not exclusively, dead white men, than to engage directly with the messy realities of ordinary life. Anthropologists, to, their con to the contrary, do their philosophizing in the world. And they study, above all, through a deep involvement in observation, conversation, and participatory practice. They study with the people among whom they choose to work. So that's why our philosophy is with the people in. Now, I first proposed this definition, philosophy with the people in, in an editorial published in 1992. I, I was the editor then of uh, the UK's premier anthropological journal, which went by the title Man. <laughs> Inside were instructions for authors telling authors to use gender neutral language wherever possible. <laughs> so, sending a, a slight contradiction, I did campaign eventually successfully to have the title of the journal changed to Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, which is what it always was. But anyway, it was still called Man at that time, and the institution was trying to make money by selling Man t-shirts. <laughs> but but that, that's when I first proposed this de definition. And, and perhaps I would add today that the people are not necessarily human. I mean, nowadays, partly as a result of the story I'm about to tell, we have become quite accustomed to acknowledge persons of multiple other than human kinds as well. So philosophy with the people in doesn't necessarily mean just human people, can be other kinds of people too. But before I proceed with this story, let me give you my longer definition of anthropology because it sets out 
what I see as the four main principles that have guided my own endeavors throughout. <clears throat> For me, anthropology is a generous, open-ended, comparative and yet critical inquiry into the conditions and possibilities of life in the one world we all inhabit. So anthropology is generous because it listens and pays attention to what others do and say, receiving with good grace what is offered, rather than seeking by subterfuge or force to extract or elicit what is not. Anthropology is open-ended because it seeks not to arrive at final solutions that would bring life to a close, but to reveal ways along which it can keep on going. It's comparative because it recognizes that no approach to life is the only possible one, and that for every approach you take, others could have been taken, which would lead in different directions. So the question, why this direction rather than that, is always uppermost in our minds. And finally, anthropology is critical because we can't be content with things as they are. I mean, by common consent, the organizations of production, distribution, governance, and knowledge that have dominated the modern era have brought the world to the brink of catastrophe. And in finding ways to carry on, we need all the help we can get. But no one, no science, no philosophy, no indigenous people already holds the key to the future, if only we could find it. We have to make that future together, ourselves, and this can only be achieved through conversation. And for me, that conversation is the one world we inhabit. And I think what anthropology does more than any other discipline of scholarship is to bring other voices into it, voices that would otherwise remain unheard or be treated merely as objects of investigation. We could say that every way of life is an experiment in living. And anthropology's mission, then, is to learn from these experiments in order to address the most fundamental question of all, how should we live? Now, back to me. I, I was supposed to have become a scientist. I'd done well in science at school with inspirational teachers. But a year of studying natural sciences at the University of Cambridge put an end to my dreams. I found much of what was taught intellectually claustrophobic, dedicated to the regimented and narrow-minded pursuit of objectives that seemed remote from experience. Many of my fellow students of the time were, were outraged by science's renunciation, as it seemed to them, of its democratic principles and its surrender to the mega machines of industrial and military power. This was, after all, the time in the mid-1960s when the Vietnam War was at its height. But I myself never became radically hostile to the scientific project. It's just that I couldn't see any future in it for myself. I wanted to study something in which there was room to breathe, where I could discover myself and the world at the same time. And that's what led me to anthropology. It seemed to me then, as it still does now, to stand at a kind of crossroads between two axes, as I've sketched in this picture here. One axis has, as its two poles, the natural sciences and the humanities. The poles of the other axis are theoretical speculation about what human life might be like and empirical observations of what it actually is like for particular people in specific places and times. And the aspiration to bridge the division between the sciences and the humanities, well, that's one that perhaps anthropology shares with philosophy. But what for me made anthropology special is that it aims to do so, to build this bridge, by also transcending the division between theory and lived experience. Now, 50 years after commencing my anthropological studies, I'm still at this crossroads, but it's a position from which I've nevertheless witnessed with 
mounting despair, I should say, the fragmentation of the discipline along the very divisions that I believed it existed to overcome. And indeed, if anything, I think they have become ever more entrenched that the humanities and the natural sciences are still breaking further apart, that theoreticians and empirical researchers are still separated from one another. So there's work to be done. But let me scroll back to the year 1974. I had graduated with a bachelor's degree in social anthropology from Cambridge in 1970 and had gone on to postgraduate research, which had taken me to the far northeast of Finland, where I had carried out doctoral fieldwork among Skolt Sami people over 16 months in 1971 to 2. Now I've just spent 12 months at the University of Helsinki in Finland while writing up my material, and with my dissertation almost finished, which dealt with the economic life, social organization, and ethnopolitics of this small and marginalized Sami minority, I've just landed my first proper job as a lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Manchester, <clears throat> where I am tasked with teaching a course that my predecessor, Basil Sansom, whose position I had replaced, had introduced a couple of years previously. And the course was called Environment and Technology. And it was basically an introduction to the subfield of cultural ecology, at that time almost unknown in the corridors of British social anthropology. And for me, at least to begin with, it was a heavily science-based course. I wanted to show that any anthropology worthy of the name would have to be at least consistent with what we know from the biological sciences about the evolution and ecology of the human species. Accordingly, we read, uh, we read classical works in ecology. You don't have to be able to read this, but I'll explain it in a moment. It's probably too small. We read um, classical works in, in ecology, such as Eugene Odom's Fundamentals of Ecology of 1971, alongside founding texts in cultural ecology by authors such as Leslie White, Julian Stewart, and Andrew Vider, as well as key sources from the so-called Chicago School of Urban Sociology, founded in the 1930s by Robert Park. When I was recently going through old papers, clearing out my office on retirement, I discovered this reading list. Uh, you can't read, it's too small probably, but I discovered this reading list from autumn 1975. So this is the first page of my autumn 1975 reading list, list just to give you an example. And, and if you can't see it, there, um, here is Odom, 1971, Fundamentals of Ecology. Here is Leslie White, Energy and the Evolution of Culture, uh, Salins and Service, Evolution and Culture, uh, Ezra Park, Robert Ezra Park, the Chicago School, and here, Julian Stewart, Theory of Culture Change, Andrew Vida, Environment and Cultural Behavior. So that was the stuff that was on my 1970, it's, it says, autumn 1975, reading list. And I should perhaps stop, just pause to highlight one of the items on this list, is this one here, Marshall Salins and Elman Service, Evolution and Culture. 1960. Marshall, uh, because there's a story behind this. In the book, the authors advance the idea, which they had taken actually from Leslie White, that evolution in general advances in proportion to the thermodynamic accomplishment of organisms in harnessing energy from the environment and putting it to use in the maintenance of structure and organization and that this applies just as much to the evolution of cultural forms as to the, that of organic ones. Now, it so happened that in my very first year of anthropological study, as a raw undergraduate, I had picked up this book, almost by accident, and was hugely enthused by it. This is it. And in great excitement, I went along to tell my tutor, who told me in no uncertain terms, never, ever, to read anything like that again. <laughs> and yet here I was, barely a decade later, uh, uh, and uh, recommending my own students to read it. So at last, 
I thought at the time, I can get my own back. But where Salins and Service, following White, were advancing a theory of general evolution, another school of thought, under the banner of cultural ecology, argued for a multilinear concept of evolution, with every culture following its own particular way of adapting to its specific environmental conditions of life. The acknowledged founder of this school, Julian Stewart, was based here at the University of Illinois from 1952 to 1972, and his key text, Theory of Culture Change, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 1955. I'm afraid I don't think that Julian Stewart is probably an ancestor to be proud of, um, but let's put that aside now. <coughs> his uh, attitude towards Native American peoples is, would not be one that would be found remotely acceptable today, but there we go, this, that, was, uh, that was then. So that was on Julian Stewart's book, Theory of Culture Change, there it is down here. That was on my reading list from 1975, along with a collection edited by Andrew Weider called Environment and Cultural Behavior, which had established itself as a sort of key source book in this field. Now at that time, in the mid-1970s, there was much interest in the question of how human populations, especially of hunters and gatherers, maintained their numbers in balance with the resources of the environment. And various social institutions and cultural practices were interpreted as functioning to that end. For example, a long period of breastfeeding, so, uh, which, which then suppresses ovulation, so women have babies further apart, these sorts of things, and also less savory things like infanticide and goodness knows what. The idea was that in the long course of evolution, any population which practices and uh, uh, that, that any, any, any population uh, whose practices and institutions failed to regulate numbers would have wiped itself out through resource depletion, leaving the field free for better regulated competitors. And this was the idea of so-called group selection, first proposed by the animal ecologist V.C. Wynne Edwards in a classic of 1962 called Animal Dispersion in Relation to Social Behavior. And extended to human populations, group selection had become all the rage in hunter-gatherer studies. Although, of course, it did beg the question of why, if these regulatory mechanisms worked so well as they were alleged to do, why should humans ever have transitioned from their original hunting and gathering way of life to the much more laborious business of farming. Not that this deterred ecological anthropologists from applying the model of group selection to crop growers as well. And a classic of the genre was a book by the anthropologist Roy Rappaport, dating from 1968, called Pigs for the Ancestors. It's a study of the relations between people, pigs, and land amongst a group called the Tembaga in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Drawing on models from animal ecology, Rappaport attempted to show that a complex of belief in ancestors, periodic warfare, and the raising and sacrifice of pigs served as an adaptive mechanism for maintaining a dynamic equilibrium or homeostasis in the balance of human, animal, and plant populations. I'm not asking you to take this seriously. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of the time. So, uh, and, and for the students taking my course, Pigs for the Ancestors became required reading, along with much else published in its wake. And in my office clearout, I found a diagram. This was before ordinary, uh, the, there weren't proper photocopiers then. This was done on some kind of silvery paper that you could just reproduce with. So, so this was a diagram I found, uh, which I used to illustrate the pig cycle. I, I think it must come from around about 1976 or 7, though I don't have the exact date. And, and just to explain, never mind about the, the diagram at the top, but this is the pig cycle here. So the, the, the breadth of this sort of this, this thing here is, it illustrates the size of the pig herd. So it's small down here, it's big up here. And, and the cycle is, is, is like this, that um, the, let, let's start at a particular moment. You, you, you take out the stakes and you plant a, a tree or bush 
which is called a rumbim. You plant the tree, and that rumbim tree planting is signals a truce in otherwise hostile relationships amongst local groups. During that truce, the pigs multiply. More and more and more pigs. You just have to take a few off every so often. There's a ceremonial for this or that. But, but the pig herd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then um, it gets so big, and this is Rappaport, the women who have to look after the pigs, or do most of the work looking after the pigs, they start complaining about it. There's too much work. And there's a point where the volume of women's complaints gets so great that the men say, right, this is the time, nothing to do with women's complaints, we have decided that this is the time to, uh, to start honouring our ancestors. So there are a whole lot of, uh, of, of ceremonials, and it ends with a great big feast that's here. When you kill almost all the pigs, and everybody has a big meal, you've paid off the ancestors for their previous support, which means now you can go to war. So then you go back to the beginning, down here, and you have a... a, a a, a, a war for uh, two or three years, during which people redistribute themselves over the land uh, in order to balance it. too many people here, too few there. So, so they, they, they redistribute themselves. And then when it's all sorted out, they, uh, they plant the rumbim tree again, and we have another uh, long period of truce. Um, when I, uh, we moved into our, our house in, in Manchester in 1974, a colleague uh, gave us a rubber plant in our house, which, uh, which still, uh, still flourishes, I have to say, after almost 50 years. And we always call it the rumbim tree and know that if that tree is uprooted, then we're in deep trouble. So, uh, so that the, the rumbim. Anyway, that's the pig cycle. And, and um, this lower diagram shows that in, in Rappaport's analysis that there are there's what he calls a regional system, that's the horizontal one here, and an ecosystem, that's the vertical one here. So this is a, a system of exchanges between different local groups who are exchanging pigs as gifts or commodities. And this is the ecosystem in which uh, people eat the pigs who eat the tubers who, which grow on the ash-strewn ground because this is a system of Sweden or slash and burn cultivation. Right, that's the pig cycle. Now... Among my departmental colleagues, this environment and technology course was not regarded with much sympathy. These, after all, were the days of the great sociobiology wars, and even to mention such topics as evolution, selection, population resource balances, was to risk accusation of genetic determinism or worse. So the course was considered to lie on the edge of the known continent of anthropology. And not for nothing was environment and technology abbreviated to ET, drawing mocking comparisons with Steven Spielberg's celebrated extraterrestrial. But in 1975, in only the second year of my appointment at Manchester, the anthropologist Marshall Salins, whose work I had read as a budding undergraduate, came to visit from Chicago. And Salins was at that time completing a book that eventually became something of a classic called Culture and Practical Reason, published uh, the following year in 1976. And the book was an explicit critique of the so-called neo-functionalism that had taken hold in ecological anthropology. Following Rappaport's example, the neo-functionalists were determined to show that every conceivable practice or institution served to maintain not just the society or the culture of which it was a part, but the entire ecosystem. And in the diagram I used for my lecture at the top here, you can see me trying to explain how neo-functionalism differs from the classic position in cultural ecology. In cultural ecology, it's the culture that is adapting to the environment by way, way of its people. In neo-functionalism, it's the people who are adapting to the environment by way of their culture. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the argument between Rappaport and Salins, but it turned on the issue of whether natural, natural systems have an intrinsic drive towards equilibrium or homeostasis, to which culture contributes as an adaptive mechanism, 
or whether the conditions of adaptation are themselves set down by culture, understood as an autonomous system of symbolic representations that is constituted quite independently of natural conditions. So Rappaport took the first view, Salins took the second, and with no compromise in sight, anthropology was apparently condemned to oscillate between culture and practical reason, as Salins famously put it, like a prisoner pacing between the walls of his cell. However, in the early 1980s, a possible solution arrived from another quarter. By that time, due to the departure of a colleague, I had come to assume responsibility for teaching economic as well as ecological anthropology. And so the course title ET had morphed to EE, Environment and Economy. Suddenly, and for what turned out to be just a few years, French neo-Marxism had become the height of fashion. It coincided with the rediscovery of Karl Marx's earlier philosophical writings. And for just a brief while, a volume entitled Pre-Capitalist Modes of Production by the sociologists Barry Hindis and Paul Q. Hurst, published in 1975, became the most sought after volume in Manchester's university library until it vanished into well-deserved well obscurity. Nobody borrows it now. But led in France by Maurice Godelier, Emmanuel Terre, and Claude Meyersu, the neo-Marxists led an all-out assault on what they snootily called the vulgar materialism of much work in cultural ecology. I too was swept up in the tide, and it became an important part of my teaching in environment and economy, as well as in a course on anthropological theory that I found myself teaching at the same time. The question of the relation between economy and environment was mapped on to the classic Marxian problem of the interplay within the infrastructure of a social formation between social relations and technical forces of production. We had to get, we had to get used to diagrams like, like this one here, which comes from a 1974 article by Jonathan Friedman entitled Marxism, Structuralism, and Vulgar Materialism. And this is, the, this is the, so, the, the social formation. This is the divided between infrastructure and superstructure. And the infrastructure then divides between forces of production and relations of production. The forces themselves will come to this, dividing between means of production and organization of production. So in the neo-Marxist scheme, the relations of production were linked to the economic the forces of production to the ecological. So economic versus ecological became relations versus forces. But for me, and in this I was following Boris Godelier, this became an inquiry into the dialectical interplay between two systems of relations, respectively social and ecological. And in, in a sense, this was a reformulation of Rappaport's question of how to model the interaction between the regional system uh, made up of relations between local groups and engaging in various forms of social exchange and the ecosystem made up of trophic exchanges between a local group, its pigs, the tubers they ate, and the nutrients of the soil. So you see, Rappaport has got his, this view. This is the regional system. This is the ecosystem go on to here, and we have the relations of production and the forces of production. So, but now, each of the two systems was given a different ontological status. So in Godelier's scheme, the social system, the system of social relations of production, was taken to be dominant insofar as it was the source of the agency that drove people's productive activities, while the ecosystem was determinant in that it set limits on what the environment could sustain, which, once exceeded, would trigger a transformation on the level of social relations and us ushering in a new historical formation. For example, pressure on resources due to increasing political centralization and a demand for surplus 
to feed a specialist elite could exceed the capacity of a land extensive system of Sweden cultivation of the kind practiced by the Tsembago in Rappaport's study, triggering a transformation to a land intensive form of irrigation agriculture with quite different relations of production. So this, instead of saying, here's, a, here's a changes that are taking place ecologically and then one after another gives rise to this form of social relations after that sort of form of social relations, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and I'll show that in a, in a second. So here is another um, undated diagram from my lectures, must have been around 1980-ish, which I discovered in my office clearance. And I used this diagram to explain the difference between the allegedly vulgar materialism of cultural ecology and the more dialectical materialism of the neo-Marxist school. You'll see that in the first scenario at the top here, um, a one-way development of technical forces of production, that's T, engenders one system of social relations after another, from S1 to S4. But in the second model here, the growing contradiction between social relations and technical forces at the, uh, during this stage here, the growing contradiction between those uh, brings about uh, another system of social relations here, calling forth new productive forces and so on. So notice here that the causal link between social relations and technical forces is inverted. And, and classical examples of this are irrigation agriculture and the coal-fired steam engine. Karl Wittfogel had famously argued that irrigation agriculture, which requires large-scale public works, would bring forth the political form of oriental despotism, despotism that is capable of mobilizing the labor needed. Neo-Marxists argued the other way round. It was the demands of the despotic state that called forth irrigation agriculture because it wanted the surplus food. And by the same token, the coal-fired steam engine was not the cause of capitalist relations of production. Rather, it was capital capitalism that brought, brought forth the Industrial Revolution enabled by the steam engine. Now, in 1986, I put together a collection of essays entitled The Appropriation of Nature, entirely devoted to the exploration of this interplay between social and ecological systems. This is the only, well, the only copy I have left of its <laughs> cover is a bit more, but that's sort of what it looked like originally. And I tried to show, for example, that human hunting can be understood both socially as a productive activity, underwritten by relations of food sharing and the division of labor between men and women, and ecologically as an interaction between human beings as natural predators and their non-human prey. So as a social being, the hunter is a person relating to other persons in society. As a, as a predator, he is an individual organism relating to other organisms in nature. So here is a scan from my, a page of my own lecture notes dated the 4th of October, 1988. In those days, no, no typing, you, you wrote all, I wrote all my lectures out uh, by hand, and I'm sketching it. So there I've made a little diagram for myself uh, to, to help explain things. Uh, and it's, it's the first of that year's, the 1988 series, on environment and economy. And I'm introducing my agenda for the course as a whole using the example of hunting to explain the distinction and the connection between social relations and ecological relations. Models from evolutionary ecology and the study of animal behavior, I say, might serve well enough to account for the interspecific dynamics of predator-prey interaction. But on their own, these models are insufficient to comprehend 
the transformations of human history which require some acknowledgement of the apparently unique power of human beings, at least up to a point, to shape their own historical destiny, to determine their productive purposes, and to bring about changes not only in their relations with the environment, but also in those relations among themselves, constitutive of society. Now, at first glance, then, social relations exist between people, ecological relations between people and the animals and plants they rely on for food. So in this diagram here, H stands for, for, for hunters and P stands for prey. So here's a system of social relations among human hunters. That's the social bit. And here's a relation between the hunter and as a predator and the prey. So that's the ecological bit. Simple. So at first glance, social relations exist between the people, ecological relations between people and the animals and plants they rely on for food. In other words, social relations are intra-specific, human-human. Ecological relations are inter-specific, human-animal or human-plant. And yet, as I went on to say in my lecture notes, and I'll quote from them, once we look at the matter more closely, it ceases to be so straightforward. First of all, considered as organisms, human beings are involved in both interspecific and intraspecific relations. Such relations must include cooperation and communication among conspecifics as much as predation of one species on another. We might just jump back to um, Jonathan Friedman's uh, diagram of the social formation here, and you see that the forces of production, which I'm equating here with ecological relations, divide between means of production and organization of production. So this organization of production could include sort of forms of cooperation, forms of cooperative work or communication going on among these individual organisms that are working together to hunt. So we had to include within this this system, this bit here, we had to include both the, uh, the, the relations among humans and relations between humans, animals, and plants. So it's beginning to get a bit more complicated. So do we conclude that, as we see from uh, this next diagram here, this is again from the next page in my lecture notes, this was the diagram I had before, here's a new one here, do we conclude that as we see from this lower diagram, that the relations we call social are simply a subset of ecological relations. But even that, then, I had to admit, could be too simple. The problem is that animal ecologists and social anthropologists were meaning quite different things by social relations and society. So for ecologists, relations between organisms of the same species a social, more or less, by definition. If it's, a, if, if it's relations among the same species, if it's intraspecific, then it's social. End of story. Uh, so, and, but nothing is implied there about subjectivity, intentionality, consciousness, or anything else of that nature. So in that sense, the so-called social insects uh, form societies just as much, just as well, as humans do. But of course, when anthropologists speak of social relations in human communities, they usually mean something more, something indeed quite different. Because for humans, we insist, they're not mere organisms, you say. No, they're not mere organisms, they are people. And they can relate to one another as one person to another. So, what about the human hunter in our example? He seems to be a being of two parts. One part organism, relating to other organisms, including other human organisms, one part person, relating to other persons. And what's more, he can also relate to the animal he hunts in both capacities. That is, both as a hunter and as a predator. And what's more, the animal too can be a person, as well as being an organism. So hunting, I began to argue, is a form of social action, intentionally performed by an agent, Whereas the word predation 
in its strict ecological sense, describes an interaction between one organism and another, resulting in the death of the latter and its consumption by the former, which in the case of our example just happens to be human. So as predation, human is hunting, sorry, as, as predation, human hunting is comparable to that by other animals, wolves, lions, crocodiles, eagles, but as social action, it is not. So I ended up, on the next page of my lecture notes, with yet another diagram, this time multicolored, with ecological relations, including predation in black, and social relations, including hunting in red, both sets of relations, including both human and other than human participants. So we've got, we got the, 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 this S stands for social, this O for organism. We've got the hunter is both a person and an organism, so he's relating to other hunters as a person, he's relating to other hunters as an organism, but by the way, the, the animal too is both an organism and a person. So, so we have two fields of relations which appear to be completely smack on top of one another. And yet, eventually, even this division between the red and the black, between the social and the ecological, turned out to be unsustainable. After reading through 16 pages of handwritten notes from my October 1988 lecture, I came across the following. I'll read it, too small for you to see, but I'll read this out. Ultimately, of course, the aim should be to transcend such dichotomies as economic versus ecological, social versus natural, person versus individual, because human beings aren't really made up of two semi-independent parts, as the homo duplex model has it, that's just a first approximation. And those words, first approximation, were the last words of that lecture, because I knew that, and as you see, the manuscript comes to an abrupt halt. I was literally stuck, followed by a blank, because by that time, I already knew deep down that my introduction to the course was going absolutely nowhere and that there would be nothing for it but to start all over again. Everything would have to be rethought because it had finally dawned on me that the model of the human being as one part organism, one part person was not even an approximation to the truth. It was simply untenable. Person and organism, I realized, were one and the same. The organism in its environment is a being in the world. And to follow this through would require a completely different kind of thinking, one that starts not from populations of individuals, as in mainstream biology, but from fields of relation. So it was no longer a matter of reconciling insult, insights from social anthropology with what we already know from the biological sciences we would have to rewrite biology itself. Now, in social anthropology, relational thinking by that time was already pretty well established. But it was increasingly out of kilter with mainstream biology, which remained, and actually still remains, firmly wedded to the populational model. So if I were to prove that person and organism are the same, I knew that I would have to extend relational thinking to the biological domain as well, and that this would mean going against the grain of what biologists call the modern synthesis in their discipline. That's a synthesis forged from the combination of Darwin's theory of variation under natural selection with the mathematical theory of population genetics. So in 1989, in a lecture that I presented to the Royal Anthropological Institute entitled An Anthropologist Looks at Biology, I presented my first attempt along these lines. And my aim was to restore the person to the continuum of organic life, not in the reductionist fashion of sociobiology by putting it all down to genes, but by repositioning the organism as a locus of growth and development within a continuous relational field, and by thinking of evolution not statistically but topologically as the unfolding of that field. 
Life sciences did, is not in organisms, rather organisms are in life. Or in other words, living things are both generated and held in place within the ever unfolding matrix of relations to which they also contribute in their activity. And this meant giving a central place to growth and development in the constitution of life forms. Now much of the inspiration for this move came from the classic work of Darcy Wentworth Thompson on growth and form, a classic more for architects than biologists, in fact. And for me, this was a bit like coming full circle, since my father, who's a distinguished mycologist, had a copy of the original 1917 edition of the book on his shelves. And as a child, I'd spend long hours immersed in its pages with its wonderful analysis of the mathematics of gastropod shells, its comparison of dinosaur skeletons with the architecture of the fourth road bridge, and so on. And over the ensuing decade, then of the 1990s, I devoted myself to working out this way of thinking and exploring its implications. So by that stage, my teaching for environment and economy had reached an impasse. In 1990 to 91 was the last year in which the course was taught, never to be revived again. But in its place, I developed two other courses which I taught in Manchester in alternate years. And they were culture, perception, and cognition, and the anthropology of art and technology. Now, in the first, I set my sights against the view, supported by an alliance between cognitive science and neo-Darwinian no, neo evolutionary biology, and more recently popularized under the brand name of evolutionary psychology, that culture is a kind of add-on a supplementary program acquired by a being that is biologically programmed from the start, and that, as such, culture undergoes its own evolution in parallel with the evolution of the species. According to this view, to every human individual is transmitted two, uh, sorry, according to, to every human individual is transmitted one package of traits at the point of conception, those are the genetic ones, G. And another package on growing up, packaged in analogous particles of culture, C. So the individual's life history, that is its phenotype, P, pans out as the conjoint expression of these genetically and culturally inherited traits under specific conditions of the environment, E. It's a view that remains extremely popular today, widely promulgated as the theory of gene culture co-evolution. But it is also completely circular, as was shown by the philosopher Susan Oyama in her 1985 book, The Ontogeny of Information. This, I think, is one of the most important and revolutionary books in the late 20th century philosophy of biology, and yet, it still remains an outlier in the mainstream of the discipline. But for me, it was a major source of inspiration. Because Oyama completely dismantles the assumption that information can be transmitted, whether genetically or by means of behaviors, words, or other equivalent symbols, independently and in advance of its subsequent expression in an environmental context. You see, this model requires on the idea that cultural information here or genetic information here can be transmitted from one generation to the next with its meanings attached prior to their expression in the phenotype under specific environmental conditions. Oyama shows how that rests on a basic circularity because it, she shows that there is no reading of the genetic or cultural script that is not part of the developmental process itself. So when people argue that genes code for this or that, or culture codes for this or that, they're getting the cut before the horse. Form and meaning are emergent from within the developmental process or arise out of it. 
And this puts paid once and for all to the idea that organisms or persons are the products of genes, culture, and environment in various proportions. They're not products, period. They are producers of their lives. And I'll return to this question of production in a moment. But that too is why in my other course on anthropology of art and technology, I sought to erase the di dichotomy between the two terms, art and technology, by appealing to the classical notions of ars from Latin and techne from Greek, both of which carried the primary connotation of skill. So I argued that all knowledge is founded in skill, that is, in the improvisatory exploration of ways of doing things under the watchful eye of more experienced hand. This, after all, is how children and apprentices learn, not through having knowledge first transmitted to them and then enacting in practice what each has individually acquired, but by growing in, knowledge, growing in knowledge, as they do in strength and stature, by following the same paths as their predecessors and under their direction. It's a process, if you will, of guided rediscovery, in which each generation stands to find out for itself much of what its forebears already knew and possibly more besides. Learning, as children know so well, but as their teachers so often do not, is a creative process in which knowledge is not so much passed on as perpetually grown and regrown. And if people differ in what they know, it's not because they've inherited different packages of transmitted representations, but because their lives have been entangled in environments and in communities of practice that differ in what they afford, in the kinds of attention they demand, and in the responses these demands call for. So in essence, skills in here in the coordination of perception and action, attention and response. So what we are used to calling cultural variation consists in the first place of variations of skill. And to account for this variation, we have to attend not to the content of cultural inheritance, but to the dynamics of ontogenetic development. Now all that rethinking which I've been preoccupied with throughout the 1990s culminated in a volume of 23 essays entitled The Perception of the Environment, published in 2000. And throughout these essays, I tried to develop a new synthesis, alternative to the mainstream alliance of cognitive science and neo-Darwinism, which would draw together insights from the fields of developmental biology, ecological psychology, and phenomenology, starting from the premise that the organism person is not a bounded self-contained entity set over against the world, which could be counted up in population, but something rather like a knot that is perpetually raveling and unraveling within an unbounded matrix of relations. So that's a picture of the person, not the usual thing, just a little circle, a person inside, environment outside. What we have is something more like that. Now, I've already mentioned the importance of the influence from developmental biology, all the way from Darcy Thompson's On Growth and Form of 1917, to Susan Oyama's Ontogeny of Information of 1985. But I need to say more about ecological psychology and phenomenology, because both played a critical role in shaping my thinking through the 1990s and beyond. But before I do so, and to pick up from where I left off in 1988, with the collapse of the dichotomy between social and ecological systems and between persons and organisms, I want to return to Marx. Because in a way, everything goes back to a simple question that Marx had posed, along with his more ecologically minded collaborator, Friedrich Engels, in an essay penned in 1846. As 
Individuals express their life, Marx and Engels wrote. So they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. So the question, what does it mean to say of human beings that what they really produce in life is themselves? Well, back in 1982, I had the honor to present the annual Malinowski Lecture at the London School of Economics, and my title was The Architect and the Bee, Reflections on the Work of Animals and Men. And I was referring to a famous passage in Capital in which Marx, comparing the worst of architects with the best of bees, concludes that the architect, however awful, has at least constructed his edifice, his edifice in his imagination before building it out of materials, something of which the bee was presumed to be incapable. And therein, it seemed, lay the essence of production, that it is preceded by a plan or mental representation of some kind which the producer proceeds to impose on the material. But in his book, Culture and Practical Reason, to which I've already referred, Marshall Salins scents a trap. He's always scenting traps. He senses this one. Salins is out to show that the imperatives of production are indeed laid down a priori by that system of symbolic representations or meanings which he calls culture and which he takes to be uniquely human. Doesn't Marx's admission that the architect starts with an idea in mind where the bee doesn't merely prove Salins's point. The architect starts with a cultural representation and that's what makes it production and that's what make produ makes production uniquely human. So how then could Marx continue to insist to the contrary that production is the underlying generative force from which ideas and conceptions are ultimately derived. Isn't that putting the cart before the horse? But in his earlier writings with Engels, preceding Capital by several decades, Marx had already proposed a solution. It lies in a more fundamental sense of production as a life process in itself, or as life begetting life, as he put it. To assert the primacy of production is thus to assert the primacy of life itself over the manifold forms that are both conceived and realized within it. And this is to, to treat to produce as an intransitive rather than a transitive verb. It's to place it alongside such verbs as to live, to work, to grow, rather than to plan to build, to make. To plan, to build, to make, always have an object. I'm making this, I'm building that. But li to live, to grow, to work, they are intransitive. They don't take an object. And this argument carries a critical corollary, which I was keen to bring out in my 1982 lecture. Because if production is a life process, marked by a quality of attention and responsiveness to the tasks at hand, that is, by its skillfulness, then it need not be guided by any prior conceptual representation at all. A living being can therefore engage in production even if it lacks a capacity to form any such mental representation, which means that animals can produce too. Even if we admit that maybe animals can't form mental representations, they can still be producers. Now, by chance, when my lecture was published in 1983, it was read by the psychologist Ed Reed, tragically lost his life as a rather young man, but it was read by Ed, Ed Reed. And at that time, Reed was one of the leading lights of the ecological approach to perception developed by James Gibson. And Ed immediately saw a connection between my approach to production and Gibson's approach to perception. And he took the trouble to write to me. In those days, you actually wrote in, on page, on pencil, you put it in an envelope, and I receive it in an envelope, and I open it up, and there's this long letter from Ed. 
in which he said, you really must read Gibson's masterwork, uh, The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception, which was first published in 1979. Read it and you'll find that there are lots of connections, he said. And when I eventually did so, it dawned on me that it did hold the key to resolving an, in, an impasse in which my own field of ecological anthropology had got itself comprehensively stuck. The question was where to place culture in the ecological equation. We can go back, right back to here, and find that this question was already troubling me in my lectures on environment and technology right at the very start. As we saw in comparing the classic position of cultural ecology here on the left, in which it's culture that adapts to the environment by way of its people, and the neo-functionalism of the right, according to which it is people who adapt to the environment by way of culture. Now, what Gibson proposed, what Gibson proposed was a theory of direct perception by which animals, human or otherwise, actively attend and respond to what the environment affords, that was the word he used, affords for their ongoing life, which is unmediated by representations of any kind. In short, Gibson was thinking of perception as I, after Marx, was thinking of production, as a continuous process that yields up not to objects or percepts, but to the life of the producer perceiver in person. And the answer to the question of where to put culture in the relation between producer, perceiver, and environment was simply to leave it out and to focus instead on variations of skill. Now, my first concerted attempt to introduce these ideas from ecological psychology into ecological anthropology was in a paper entitled <coughs> Culture and the Perception of the Environment, which was published in 1992. And this is a, a diagram from that paper which indicates the difference between the sort of standard anthropological view, which is still based on a, on a dualism between culture and nature. So in, in production, you impose, this is Salin's model, in production, you impose cultural forms upon the bedrock of nature. In consumption, which is equivalent to perception, the opposite occurs. This is the Gibsonian model where we have a direct a direct relationship between person and environment and production and consumption going that way. You don't need the culture-nature dichotomy anymore. Now, so far as I know, this was without precedent. I, I don't think anybody had tried doing this before in anthropology. And I went about it by comparing and contrasting Gibson's approach to perception to the Umwelt theory that had been developed in the interwar years by Jakob von Uexku, rather little known at the time, but now recognized as foundational to the burgeoning field of biosemiotics. Now, without going into detail, the basic difference is that for von Uexku, the animal projects meaning out onto the environment in ways consonant with its life project, whereas for Gibson, the animal is moving around in the environment. The animal, in moving around in the environment, discovers what it affords. So, Exkul's an animal is projecting meanings out onto the environment. Gibson's is exploring the environment, discovering the meanings in the environment itself. And I still find Gibson's approach the more fruitful, though I have to confess that I failed to convince the majority of my anthropological colleagues, who have tended to fall instead for the seduction of uh, semiotics, uh, Eduardo Cohn's uh, celebrated book being a case in point. Be that as it may, the ecological approach to perception became a key component of the new synthesis I was attempting to develop, starting from the premise of the living organism as a locus of growth and development within an unfolding field of relation. Nevertheless, as my inquiries proceeded, I discovered that this approach was not without its limitations. And of these, the most significant lies in a certain asymmetry in its treatment of the perceiver on the one hand 
and the environment on the other. Because whereas Gibson assumes the perceiver to be lively, active, and mobile, exploring the environment, the environment was treated as if it was already laid out in fixed and objective forms. It's just there. It's just settled down. It's, so it's, it's just there, ready and waiting for perceivers to arrive, as it were, on set to discover what it affords for them. So imagine the stage set, all the properties set out, all the, all the scenery, and on come the actors, and they start doing their thing. And yet it's perfectly obvious that no real environments are like that. Rather, they are continually coming into being around and in relation to the perceiver. Or to put it another way, perceivers <coughs> are at large in a world that is forever worlding, on the verge of disclosure. And there's a sense in which every time we attend to this worlding world, it is as if for the first time. And to catch this sense, we have to move perception, as it were, upstream. And that meant moving upstream theoretically as well, a journey that took me from Gibson's ecology of perception to the phenomenology of perception of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. In a nutshell, where Gibson explains what it means to see, hear, or touch this or that, where this and that are objects in the environment, Meloponti teaches us what it means to see, or to hear, or to feel, in a media that has still to settle out into objective forms. Gibson says, I can see tables, chairs, and what. Meloponti says, I can see. What amazing thing is that? What does it mean? So it's, in brief, an experience, an experience of light or sound or feeling. Now, I've often heard it said by those who like putting scholars in pigeonholes that I am a phenomenologist. So let me say at once that I never deliberately set out to adopt a phenomenological approach. And to the extent that I've landed up in phenomenology, it is more by default than by design. Indeed, my phenomenology is largely homemade and probably takes all kinds of liberties with the canonical texts. But what I have tried to do, and quite deliberately, is to ground my inquiries in what I see as a search for truth. And by truth, I don't mean some kind of bedrock of, fa of, of uh, factual, objective reality, but rather, this is my definition of truth, the unison of experience and imagination in a world to which we are alive and that is alive to us. So I suppose that at heart, I'm a vitalist. So I'd like to conclude with a story that begins pretty early on in my trajectory, sometime in 1983. I was in the midst of writing a big book which it was intended to chart the history of the idea of evolution in biology, history, and anthropology from the mid-19th century to the present. Published in 1986, it was, uh, the book was called Evolution and Social Life. I was looking for something, I don't any longer remember what, I was looking for something on the shelves of Manchester's John Ryland's University Library when my attention was caught by another volume. It was Creative Evolution, by the French philosophy, philosopher Henri Bergson, in a translation dating from 1911. Now, at that time, I knew nothing about Bergson or his book, but intrigued by the title, I loaned the book and took it home with me. And as soon as I opened it, I began to sneeze. Since having lain unread for decades, the book was full of dust. But as I read and read, I was completely blown away by it. Here expressed in incomparable po prose, even poetic prose, was everything I had been attempting to say. Because Bergson was trying to understand evolution from within, as a life process. And so I realized, was I. And from, from then on, my book, which up until then had been framed by an opposition between the mechanism of Darwinian approaches and the finalism of those who saw in evolution an unilinear ascent, 
towards a preordained goal, my, took, my book took on a completely new direction. Now, the book itself, when it eventually came out, was a complete flop. I mean, among evolutionary biologists, Bergson's oeuvre had been so comprehensively debunked as automatically to discredit anyone who took it seriously. While among my anthropological colleagues, the whole idea of evolution remained toxic. However, more than any other philosopher, Bergson laid the foundations for my own thinking, and it still resonates with me just as strongly today, now that his work is undergoing something of a revival, spurred on by the advocacy of Gilles Deleuze. And it's with an image from Deleuze that I want to end. Imagine a river flowing between its banks. You can stand on one bank or the other, or attempt to build a bridge across. Perhaps there's nature on one bank and culture on the other, or mechanism and finalism, or mind and world, or any other of the master dichotomies that have ruled, us, ruled our thinking for so long. But it is another thing altogether to join with the river current, flowing in a direction at right angles to the line connecting its banks. And that's where I am, still today, doing my philosophy in the worlding world, a world with the people in. Thank you very much. And if we don't get this part, it's just <coughs> okay. Um, so uh, thank you for that uh, talk and that that retrospection. It, it brings us from anthropology out into which I, is a world I'm not part of, but into a world um, that is I don't want to say interdisciplinary, but much broader. Uh, before we get into our discussion, our interview, I just want to um, introduce Aaron Wiggs, who's, when did you come to campus? Last Three year. year. Just, just last, last year? year. Yeah. Okay, so you're really new. All right, so Aaron is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology and specializes in historical anthropology. Do I have that right? And contemporary archaeology. And contemporary, both. Okay, the whole thing. Working on a book about um, uh, refugee settlement in India after the 1947 partition, and you just won an NEH fellowship for next year? I did. Fantastic. Yes. Wonderful. All right, with that, uh, we have a couple of questions we want to ask you just to kind of get you to think about some things that we were thinking about, and we'll start with Erin. You started your career in the natural sciences, studying as an undergraduate student, and you spoke of how your dad worked in the natural sciences as well but you've written about how you quickly became disillusioned with that field of study. It was really a delight to hear your talk today, sort of your auto-archaeology of piecing through your old office papers, and becoming further disillusioned with um, that type of thinking, even being a presence within anthropology at the time when you started, um, and seeing ecology and social as being very separate things. Um, I wanted to ask you, have you gotten a lot of reactions from scholars who work in the natural sciences about your line of thinking? Have they been impacted? <laughs> uh, I've had a, a long battle, I'm, I'm battle scarred from arguments <laughs> with, uh, uh, with, with biologists and also psychologists of, a, of an evolutionary Darwinian persuasion. Um, I'm battle scarred because these people are extremely intolerant. Uh, I, I sometimes think that, that, that mainstream evolutionary biology is like an oil tanker. You know how difficult it is. Just, just, just a slight deflection of the course, and they throw up their hands as though this is. And, and so I, I'm, I'm a way off 
uh, so they don't know how to, they, they don't really know how to, how to deal with me. And, and when they don't know how to deal with me, what they do, what you get actually is personal, you get abuse. I mean, I've got a lot of it. I'm just a stupid anthropologist. I don't understand. I, I, you know, I've misunderstood everything. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. It, it gets, actually, it gets quite, it gets quite nasty at times. Um, and, and, and for many times I thought, I just want to withdraw. I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with this kind of thing. But, but that's not true of all science. I mean, this is, this is a particular branch of, uh, the, the, of, 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 of biology and psychology, which seems to be especially resistant to, to radical rethinking. Things are changing. I mean, there, there's a, there are lots of changes uh, afoot in biology at the moment, and I'm hopeful that, that there really will be a, a sea change but it's very slow in coming in. And now just without prolonging it, just say that the, the, the major source of frustration is this, that I want to point to what I see as epistemological problems in the framing of their arguments. Their response is always to say to me, okay, you've got a problem, where's your data? And I have to explain to them that this kind of epistemological problem is not soluble by reference to data because their idea of data is already presupposing the very epistemology that for me is problematic. And, and for mainstream thinkers in that field, those epistemological truths are simply non-negotiable because the whole superstructure of their, of their subject rests on it. And this makes it so very, very difficult to get anywhere. It's, it's deeply frustrating. So I'm recalling an, a part of a conversation we had earlier today when you were talking about context. And you said, you know, mm. the first thing the scientists do is to strip away the context mm. so that they have a kind of pure mm. uh, example that they can study with, with no variables, right? Or all the variables are mm. accounted for. It, it, I'm trying to get a question out of that. Can you talk more about that? Because it was very interesting the way you described it and how different you are. Uh, when you were talking yeah, about it earlier. There, there, there are two different ways of understanding what decontextualizing might be. And, and so an example of the sort of scientific way of doing it, if you go back to that, I just flip back to this, this, um, this diagram because it, I, can, I, can, I can use it. Uh, this one here. Um, so this, uh, this is a typical, it's not my diagram, it comes from some scientific text. And, and, um, uh, and, and so it shows you've got one, you've got some genes coming down, and you've got some cultural traits, or whatever, particles coming down. And uh, this is a classic example of decontextualization because there's an assumption here that um, genes, which actually, the, 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 the genes, yes, even genes, which actually only take their meaning from the developmental processes in which they are in play, come with their meanings pre-attached. So in other words, they're, 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 they're cutting out, they're treating meaning as something that be, can be regarded as consisting in isolated particles when we know that there's no meaning that is not relational, that is not founded in the way words, uh, words are involved in conversations, genes in developmental processes and, and so on. So that, that's how, decontextualization typically works in that area of science. This morning I was talking about decontextualization, I meant it in a quite different sense, um, in the sense of getting to, the, it's actually a vitalist sense, the sense of getting to the living essence of something um, behind the, um, the surface, well, that's not quite the right word, but, but I, I can answer it by, by with, a, with a lovely story from, from Kandinsky, a little tale he told. Tell, it's, 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 it's an essay which is just half a page long, and it's called Line and Fish. And, and he says, well, the thing about the fish is it's a creature in the world. Uh, it can, you can see it in a river. Uh, you can have it on a plate for dinner. Uh, and in each case, in the river or on a plate for dinner, it's in its context. There it is, there's the fish with a, the with a context around it of the kitchen stuff or the, or the, or the river bank and, and the river and, and, and its bank. So it's in its context, it's doing its thing. 
But if you really want to get down to what makes that fish a, a vital living being, you need to strip away all of that, and what you're left with is a line. Because the fish is a streak, streaks through the water, and, mm. it's, and it's a line. And he says, that's why I prefer the line to the fish, at least in my painting. And I tried this out myself. Uh, I've been watching salmon leaping a rapids. And, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll draw these salmon leaping a rapids. And I, I ended up with something like this. And then I tried drawing the salmon, like you would see it in the fishmongers, right? Quite different. So, so this, is the, this is the outline drawing that says, that is a fish, an object in its environment. This is the line. And that's the kind of decontextualization yes. that, that he was trying to get at, which is of a completely different kind. Yeah. It's really hard to express the difference. Yeah. It's... Um, I'd, I'd like to ask a question that relates to what you see as the possible broader impacts of your way of viewing the world. In many of your recent works, particularly anthropology and as education, and anthropology, why it matters, you argue that studying with things and with others instead of making studies of them can impart positive change in the world. Can you speak a bit about how you think acknowledging the enmeshed nature of people and material worlds may be a force of good in a world facing many impending disasters, things like climate change, violence, war? Um, yeah, the, 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 my view is that um, we, we're, we're in a situation now where we can't afford not to pay attention to all the experience and wisdom and knowledge that is around all the people everywhere in this world. And, and, and that means treating the whole world itself as our university. Um, I, I think there's so much academic writing maintains the walls of the academy. So that's why I have a bit of a problem, for example, with, with ethnography. When, when, when you go to study with your professor as a student, you don't go and say, I'm doing an ethnography of my professor. You say, I'm hoping that I might learn something that could be of use in helping me sort out um, how to live in this world. And you're hoping you're going to learn something. But then when we go outside to do field work with other people, we say, oh, I'm just doing ethnography. I'm, I'm, I'm studying what these people say in order to find out what it tells about them. But if we, were, if we were to truly knock down the walls of the academy, then we should be treating the people among whom we're working in just the same way as the people we study with inside the university and say, we, 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 we want to talk with you about these issues. And here, you've, uh, if, if you think of every way of life as an experiment, and you say, you've been, you've been doing this experiment. You know, how's it worked out? How, what things have worked and what things have not worked? What can we learn from them? And by the way, this is what I've been doing. And maybe, um, um, so well, let's have a conversation about it. And, and I think that, that we're, we're never going to find the, the final solution to the question, heaven forbid, that we find a final solution to the question of, of how to live. But, but isn't it better that we involve in this great conversation about how to live in the world as many people with as much experience as possible. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but it means that we bring them into the conversation. And, and I think that's what, because anthropology generally adheres to the view that what we should take other people seriously and what they say seriously, to an extent I think that other disciplines don't, uh, that's why I think the huge contribution that anthropology has, has to make. I have a little bit of a follow-up question to that. Um, does this still leave space for being critical and even placing blame? So anthropology traditionally has left a lot of space for continuous um, redevelopments of new meanings, mm. right? Race isn't biologically real, but it becomes real through processes of racialization or any type of cultural category, gender, mm. ethnicity, all of these are always in becoming. Mm. Um, if we add your way of thinking of adding in matter in flux as being a part of those meanings in creation, 
is there still space for being critical of individual thinkers who are ultimately causing harm to others? Of course there is. Of course there is. The, 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 the critical was the, the force. I mean, there, was, there was generosity, com comparison, open-endedness, and criticality, criticalness. Mm -hmm. And being critical is, 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 um, is, is absolutely essential. And, and, and we are entitled to be critical of anybody. I mean, in a way, being critical is a part of taking other people seriously. <clears throat> and, and, and I mean, some colleagues have raised the question that sometimes they say, well, what you, what you advise would be great if all the people we worked with were really lovely people and had some <laughs> terrific experience to share. Um, but what, what happens when some of these people are ghastly and have, have committed all, all manner of atrocities? What, what do we do? And doesn't that invalidate your approach? Because really, we've got nothing to learn from them. And, and I think the, the answer to that is that we have to, this would be a problem if we still felt that it was somehow our obligation or in our gift to represent the thought of these other people to a wider public. But that's not what it is. The people are now are perfectly well capable of, 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 of representing themselves. I, th and I think that our... Uh, our position should be to say, we've made all these studies, we've read all these works, we've thought all these thoughts, and this is what I or we think on this matter. And this is our contribution to a public debate. So if there's some public debate about how we should treat the environment or how we should deal with race or whatever, whatever the issue might be, and there, there are plenty of them, war, then, then um, we as anthropologists should be able to get up and say, I've done all these studies, I've done all this thinking, I've talked to people, and this is the view I have come out with, and I'm prepared, and I want to try and persuade you that this is the right and proper view to take. Uh, and, and that's our view. It doesn't make any pretense to be representative of any view or even any ontology of the people uh, we've studied, and I, I, I just worry that to the extent that we, we, we think that what we're there to do is to bring accounts of life amongst other people to the table, um, that we lose the right to speak for ourselves. And, and, and we really have to do that because at the moment the stage is being taken by psychologists, by economists, by business people who are spouting all kinds of sometimes dangerous nonsense um, based on their authority. They have no qualms. An economist has no qualms to say, I'm speaking as an economist and you should sit up and listen. <laughs> Why can't we do that for ourselves as anthropologists? And, and still, the, when, when an anthropologist stands up on such an occasion, People assume, oh, they must be speaking. They've done field work among so and so, and that's what they're talking about. It's not that. We should be able to stand up and speak for ourselves. I think that's really, really important. So I want to follow up on that um, because you're kind of talking about the, the authority of the discipline hmm. that we claim. And so the, the question that I have, and there's a little bit of a preamble to this, which is in defense of disciplinarity to begin with, Humans seem driven to classify the world according to rules. The rules, we may draw a line between earth and sky, between animate, inanimate, human, animal, animal, <coughs> vegetable, mineral. I mean, I think of all these ways in which we kind of create these categories. And that kind of organizing knowledge can be very useful, right? We, we need organization. We need some kind of a, uh, uh, a way of identifying what's the same, what's different, uh, so that we can compare. And as you point out, the objectification of the world, this, this, you know, the difference between me and the world is another really important line. And you say that the objectification of the world is embedded in our very grammar. Earlier today, you were talking about subject, you know, subject, verb, object, and then, and then even today, you're talking about the intransitive verb that doesn't have the object and how different that is. So methods of this kind of classification, of this kind of analysis, this way of structuring the world, are often learned through disciplinarity, at least for academics, right? We're trained to be disciplined in the way that we study the world, and disciplinarity's been with us for a long time. So 
my question is, how do you view disciplinarity? Because you've just, you've just kind of given us a damning example of all these people who speak from their disciplines and tell the rest of us to shut up. Mm -hmm. and, and some disciplines are not listened to the way others are listened to, especially in the world where STEM rules and the humanities are struggling to um, show our importance. That's true. I, I think that in, in practice, should I be holding it? Or is I don't mind holding it for you. This is what I'm doing. Um, this is my job. In, 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 in practice, every discipline is a conversation, isn't it, amongst the people who are practicing it? Uh, and, and, then, and, and actually not just one conversation, but a whole bundle of conversations that are happening here, there, and everywhere. And that's, that's certainly true of anthropology. And there are bunches of people, and they're talking to one another. And, 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 all the, and sometimes, um, as in conversation, lines converge, everybody suddenly gets enthused about some topic and then they diverge again and they come. So you've got this, you've got this sort of mesh of, of, of converging and diverging lines rather than uh, a, 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 something like a terrain that is divided up into bounded territories. That's on a, on a colonial map. You know, it's not, it's, although that might be the way in which managers and university administrators see it. But in practice for scholars, I don't think it's like that. It's, it's, it's what, what are temporarily called disciplines, they emerge as, as kind of points of convergence in, in ongoing conversations. Um, and um, I do think there is a place for, um, for authority um, in a um, actually, you could get, get the argument for it from Hannah Arendt, who, who has a, a view of authority as actually um, a way of exercising responsibility for a world that you're introducing other people into. Mm. And that means that it's not actually confrontational. When we talk about authority, we so often think that there's, there's one person facing another. You know, Here's the person in authority and facing you, you're <laughs> saying... <laughs> is what you're supposed to do, and, and we're face to face. But, but you can think of authority in a different kind of way, um, a bit the same way as um, you would say in a, in a craft, you know, that somebody who's a really expert practitioner is an authority in that discipline of pottery or something like that, and that person would have their followers. And the disciplinarian is a disciple who follows the master watches what the master is doing, learns from it, and carries on their own practice in their turn. And, 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 and I think that's not a bad model of the discipline to follow. And in some ways, it's anti-classificatory. I don't think it's true of all humans that we innately classify. I think this is, a, I think this is probably a mistake, and there are plenty of, of studies that would question that. Um, but it's certainly true of a certain kind of colonizing mentality that it works by classification. So I think decolonizing is also a, 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 a declassifying, declassificatory move as well. With that, perhaps we could offer, open the floor to everybody. Any questions that might come from the floor? Shomu? Hello, Catherine. Um, well, thank you so much for the talk. And uh, I wanted to like, So we'll speak up because from okay, back maybe, there, okay. just about. Okay. Maybe. Uh, so the way you navigated the various models of, of, of the, the people of the human, it, it seemed to me that throughout your career, it was that you were, you were attached to the idea that there is a possibility of a universal model of the human, that that possibility lies at the humans. And it can be iterated, it can be challenged, it can be broken down, and can be built up again. But nonetheless, there remains kind of a fundamental assumption that a universal model of a human is possible. So my, my question to you is that, that in that case, how do you respond to the debate of universalism versus difference, which has been one of the central uh, debate of post-colonial inquiry? So, so that's my broader question. Universal only in the sense of um, a universe of difference. I mean, the, the, uh, to, to, to use a term that um, is becoming 
quite popular now, I, I would prefer to say pluriversal uh, and say that, that humankind, no, that's a bad word, but, but the human is a, is, is refers to a, 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 the phenomenon of human is refers to a pluriverse. And the thing about the idea of the pluriverse is that it gets over the dichotomy between the singular versus the multiple. Um, the pluriverse is both one and many at the same time. And that's how I would conceive of a conversation, uh, that, um, that a conversation has all these different strands. Uh, and you, could, you can follow any number of different paths through it. It's continually differentiating. But nevertheless, um, you can't find any divisions within it. Uh, and, and it's continually overflowing itself. So it's a, it's a domain of, in, of, of, of inexhaustible differentiation, but one in which it is through differentiation that people come together. That's the key thing. It's, a, it's about living together in difference. It's, it's actually in differentiating ourselves from one another that we join with one another. And, and, and that's what happens in any conversation. And if one thinks of that conversation writ large, then we have a pluriversal model of the human. And I don't think that's a bad thing to hold on to. Uh, there's another, it's another argument, but I also think that there's a, there is a benign form of anthropocentrism that we should be aiming for, which does put human at the heart of a world that we're caring for. Uh, and that does give us very particular responsibilities that lie in capacities that, that human beings have that I do think we, we are, are um, not shared by other beings. The capacity in particular to tell the stories of others while still living our own. I don't think that other animals, other creatures do that. And I think that because of that, we have a very special responsibility for the future planetary flourishing, and therefore we need to have a model of anthropos that allows us to fulfill that responsibility, and one that simply damns anthropocentrism and says that the only alternative is one that is post-human, then that leaves no, no space for human at all, is no answer, I think. That's, that's my view. Yeah, lots of questions coming up. I think I saw David's hand go up first, and then Blair, you'll be second. Thank you very much. I'm not an anthropologist, um, but I'm very interested in your, your kind of conceptual search for the repositioning of the organism. And what I'm especially interested in is, is the literatures that, that you made and brought into this kind of epistemological uh, project, and literatures that you decided not to, that you kind of purge in your, in your search and your quest. Um, I'm wondering about uh, humanistic psychoanalysis. Hmm. Would, that, would that have been a possibility to be with the greatest insights into your work? I mean, you're absolutely right that I haven't. And, and I, I, I can't see any a priori reason why I shouldn't. Uh, I, I, I might simply plead the usual thing that you can't possibly manage everything. And, and, and there are moments when you when you have to, well, well, you might look back and you say you made choices, but, but in practice, it, it tends to happen, doesn't it, in scholarship, that you're following your own nose, going from one reference to another, one thing leads to another, and, and you find that you've gone on one path, um, and having gone on there, it's pretty hard to switch over to another one. That would mean you have to go right back and start on another loop. And, and I think, I, I, I can't deny that that I've always felt slightly suspicious about psychoanalysis, but it's a suspicion that's based on ignorance rather than any, I couldn't produce any reason, argument for it. It, it. There's some stylistic element in this. You know how when you read work, there's work that speaks to you, even if you disagree with it. You, you, say, you immediately feel, right, I'm, I'm engaged with this person, I'm part, I'm part of this conversation. And there's work which seems to, which just doesn't, doesn't speak to you. And, and sometimes this is purely temperamental thing. It's about you know, liking one food stuff rather than another. But you're right that I've not gone down the route of psychoanalysis. And people I profoundly respect 
have. Uh, so uh, I think it, there might be a degree of arbitrary material. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll be your next book. <laughs> <laughs> next book. Blair, you had your hand up. Thank you. I wanted to ask you how you understand the relationship between embodied knowledge and discursive Knowledge and imagination. Oh, okay. Um, I, I've, um, I've been campaigning recently a little bit against the overuse of the concept of embodiment. Uh, I think it's overdone and that it has sometimes led to unfortunate consequence, consequences. Um, there's no problem about bodily. It's the problem, the problem comes when bodily is replaced by embodied. To me, these words are profoundly different. You're talking about breathing, and, and um, you know, it's perfectly obvious that breathing is a bodily movement, bodily practice, a bodily business. We do it, we use our bodies to breathe. But if you said, therefore, breathing is embodied, you're in deep trouble, because the M of embody means actually means this is what it means m a enfolding a sinking in in and and well that might be for breathing in but it doesn't work for breathing out and it's it's it, so it, you know you can't embody breath you you suffocate so so I, th I think we have to be very very careful about that and also recognize that um in their production, whether it's in speech or in writing, words are also things that we as bodies produce. And I get very annoyed, I should say annoyed, but they're, but they're it's critical anyway, of, of, of um, people who argue a priori that embodied experience or bodily experience must be non-verbal. Uh, this is, seems to me to be, to, to entail a, a curious reduction of the word. It's as though words are just the things that are left over after they've been uttered or after they've been written, rather than things that, that what, what actually wells up on the breath, as is happening now, uh, or from the hand when you write. So I, I'm, I've been trying, and when dealing with this, these issues of imagination, I, I, it's something I've been writing recently, that, that trying to find a way of, um, uh, of, of, of bringing um, uh, the um, words and imagination and body all together, instead of putting words, in, imagining some sort of column with words at the top and embodied practices at the bottom. Hmm. Uh, you can, you can find it in something like Pierre Bourdieu, you know, that the, 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 the practice just sort of sinks down somewhere beyond the reach of discourse. It's, 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 not, it's not down there, it's, it's all around. So, yeah, I don't know if that's an answer, but... <laughs> um, Sayak and... So we'll... One, two. Yeah. I know a kind of a critical question, which is in geography, anthropology, or sociology, rather the whole critical social theory, of a kind of a very disposition of a idea of collective or community. So I found this methodologically challenging. For example, if I'm going to study a street, where a, an individual with a street, with the material, have a very different set of directions. And uh, so my question is how we can develop a kind of a loose ligature or, or a loose framework to talk about those individual experiences and rather recognize those individual experiences, phenomenological experiences, rather than jump into those credentials highly of the mm. <coughs> But But then um, I think it was reading um, and I just can't remember the source now, but, 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 but the point is that, that the word community comes from 
a Latin communus, which means not living together, but giving together. And, um, <clears throat> and you can only have a, a people giving things to one another if they're all different. And otherwise, they'd have nothing to give. Um, so, that, so that actually, and this was the argument, I wish I could remember the, the, the name of the source now, but the argument is that, that, that oh, and, and there's a, there's the philosopher <coughs> Alfonso Lingis has a, a book with a wonderful title, The Community of Those Who Have Nothing in Common. And, and, and what he means by that is that um, it is precisely because everybody is a bit different, everybody has slightly different experiences to draw on, that they can then come together, um, that each has something, as it were, to, to offer to the conversation. Uh, as against the idea that, that um, community means falling back on some kind of common denominator that everybody has to begin with. Because then you get the idea of communities, uh, identitarian communities, defending their common interests against outsiders. But if instead we think of the community as an unbounded collectivity, which is formed of difference, uh, where everybody can participate precisely because they have experience to share, because their experience is not the same as the other person's, then, then I think we can get over the difficulty that you refer to. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I'm, I am an anthropologist, and I, when I was in grad school, I remember <coughs> reading this sermon, Servants of Solid and White, and you know, the old relics. And mm -hmm. But what was amazing about your talk, I think, was in part you just brought them alive again, you talked through in conversation with them, and, and bringing them to this point in just such a great way to teach it for us to learn. Or to do ethnography, as you would say. But I, I was thinking about this last question. I mean, not this last question here, but the question of the conversation up front, where we're talking about being an expert and authority and disciplinarity, and how anthropologists don't often take that. And I thought, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't speak for a community that I work with in Central Asia, and I do, not in the way you expect in that in an article, but I'm often in court um, mm. as an expert. Um, mm. And um, I realized that that is a particular context where I'm taking that position, but generally, like, I walk in the world, people don't know I'm an anthropologist, they don't know where I work, I speak, you know, I can say things, but I'm not necessarily seen as an expert. So my question here is, so I'm going to seem like a leap, but what's the future of the university? Because, <laughs> 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 you know, the university, I mean, we are, we are being questioned from all sides, mm. and, you know, and our authority and our expertise uh, are rightfully being questioned. So I wondered if you could speak to that. I, yeah, I can. Um, there's, a, there's a debate going on, um, at least amongst colleagues in the UK, I don't know, is it the same here, um, between in the, the <clears throat> everybody agrees that the neoliberal new public management model of the university is unsustainable, that it can't possibly continue, um, and it's already falling apart. Some people say that the whole system is so corrupt that there is no alternative but to simply let the universities sink into the ocean and, um, and establish something else, some other form of education that would do what we really want to do, which is to provide opportunities for people to learn wherever they want and grow and flourish. The other view is to say that, no, we have these institutions. We have the buildings, we have the people, we have the skills. So rather than waiting for them all to crash, we need to start thinking how to restructure them now. I'm, I'm of that second view myself. I think it will, and I, so I think it's an urgent task that we need to get on with. And I'm struck by the fact that academics are very good at telling everybody why the present system is wrong and doesn't work. And there are thousands of books on the subject, and we all know perfectly well what's gone wrong, what the reasons are, 
we know who's responsible, pretty much. Uh, <clears throat> but what we seem to be unable to do is to come up with a very clear model of what the university of the future should be like, what, it, what principles it should stand for, what should it do, what should it be, its, its relation to its region, all things like that. And, um, and we need to get on with that. I have my own view about, about what it might be because in my own university, I led a movement to reclaim it, uh, which was successful. And, and <clears throat> And we, we wrote up a manifesto for what we thought was, and the, the, for the university of the future, which we based, rested it on four pillars. And the pillars were, um, were let me get it right now. <laughs> this is a long time ago. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the freedom, trust, education, and community, those four pillars. And then we had to address precisely what we meant by those four terms, and then think about how it could be achieved. <clears throat> and we need everybody to be doing that. Uh, uh, and, and I think there's an appetite for it. But what I did learn from our movement is that you can't wait for people in the top to take the initiative. They're very happy where they are. And the, the, the only way to do it is through local movements that build up from the bottom. Uh, and it's tough, tough because, uh, because staff themselves who would perhaps instigate much of this or coordinate it are in such insecure positions. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Um, but I, 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 I would advocate a model of the pluriversity and, and, and the first thing we'd have to do is to get rid of the ranking system and say that the first obligation of a university is towards its region. Uh, I, I, I would take, it, take the model of a university as, as something like a public library. A public library is somewhere in the, <clears throat> in the middle of a community where, where anybody who wants to find a book and read or definitely can, can go there. And, uh, uh, and, and it, it forms that very basic function. And I think the university should be doing that kind of thing. It strikes me that the university has become so um, entangled with our class system, mm. um, which is unlike a public library, which is, you know, everybody uses yes, it. Yes, they've had it. Goodness knows, it's, it's a big job. It's, 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 yeah, <laughs> it's a big job. <coughs> Other questions? Uh, we should have a reception just about now, but as usual with anything I plan, it's, it's there, but we don't know if it's going to happen now or in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's supposed to happen at 5. Yeah, you want to run in there and tell her that we're, we're all anxious for a glass of wine? <laughs> I mean, the, the, so you called it a manifesto, but the, what I'm more familiar with, and everyone will all the faculty will recognize this as the strategic plan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hate them. No, but there's a difference. <laughs> the big ours difference. Was a, ours was big. a manifesto, not yeah, a strategic plan. Exactly. Plan. Big mm. difference. Strategy is so objectifying. Yeah. Stan, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, you got to think about the problem of the university. Where, does uh, it where has the breadth of knowledge failed, where it failed that a university is supposed to provide? Did I mm. get that right? Yeah. I mean, I found that the, the big difficulty is how to get the scientists on board in any kind of enterprise of this, of this mm. kind. Uh, science has its own priorities. It has lots of funding. It has its career structures. And it socializes people to... To, to, to follow them as, as highly paid expert professionals. And they have an interest in preserving that. And my experience too is that, that, that it, it, only sort of the, the maverick scientists were really interested in, 
in rocking the boat and, and, and really engaging. There's a lot of talk, sort of fine talk about interdisciplinary engagement, blah, 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 but, but, there, but that on the whole, um, we find it very difficult to get scientists to buy in to a genuine conversation of voices. Uh, and which is nothing, I mean, the, when, we shouldn't be against scientists, they, they're lovely people, but there's something about the institutionalization of science and the structures that people find themselves having to work in that is inc incredibly constraining. I mean, it's why I didn't become a scientist myself in the end. I, I took one look at it and decided that's not where I wanted to be. It's very, very top heavy, very conservative, and of course, everything now revolves around STEM, and I think, <coughs> and I think that STEM is it, uh, is a sort of umbrella that hides the corporate capture of the universities as uh, as research institutes for um, for for, science, for for cor corporate research institutions, where they can have their research done on the cheap, and um, that that in a way we we need to rescue the scientists from from STEM-induced stultification. But I, goodness knows how we do it. I, it's, sometimes it, it, I despair, it's the magnitude of the task. Well, with that, I think we should thank you again for your